All right, welcome back to Discipleship Training. We are continuing the series on God's framework for discipleship. And last week, we entered into our final section talking about humility. And what it's going to act as is, one, we will learn, obviously, how critical humility is, not only um, in, in, our life, in terms of our character, but as it pertains to building disciples. And so with that, we'll also get a recap of all the other sections within the framework so we can um, gather all that knowledge into a nice, a nice summary by seeing how, um, as I mentioned last week, that humility is the foundation of our entire life when it comes to walking with Jesus and being disciples because humility as defined through scripture um, as we'll do a recap of what we talked about uh, last week and building on that um, we defined both the Hebrew and the Greek and so summarizing those definitions what we see humility is our willingness to submit to bow down to be subdued, to be brought down, and to submit to God's sovereignty and authority in our lives. And what we saw through scripture is there are multiple ways to do that. We can do it willingly when we bring ourselves into subjection to that sovereignty and authority. We can be forcibly brought, meaning through our sins and actions, we call ourselves, we cause ourselves to be humbled. And then we have a decision to make. Um, so we looked at we looked at that in scripture, and then the other one we looked at is humility is afflicting ourselves, whether that is through fasting or some form of sacrifice. We do that to humble our flesh uh, under the authority of the Holy Spirit. And what we then began to talk about after those uh, definitions is starting with the conversion process. Uh, which is the the first step within the framework of disciples discipleship, right? A sinner must be converted into a saint in order to even begin the process of being developed into a disciple. And we started looking at repentance and how repentance is an action of humility because we are making the decision to turn away and leave behind a life of sin along with its attachments such as benefits, relationships, habits, hobbies, which is requires the sinner to admit they were wrong, that that lifestyle was wrong, that that lifestyle was contrary to God and set that pride aside, that stubbornness aside, that foolishness aside and turn away and walk in repentance, walk towards God. That whole process requires humility. Adriana. Sorry, that was an accident. Good morning, everyone. Oh, good morning. Um, and uh, good morning, Jose. See you in the chat. Um, and so that's what we talked about last week, where it was really defining humility so we could understand as we now begin to build out looking at humility and how it's intertwined with every aspect of our development as a disciple and the first one is humility so we'll pick up from there and we're seeing in scripture when we see repentance when we see the process of repentance or unrepentance we see that stubbornness that's that uh what scripture refers to as having a stiff neck that inability to set our pride aside to turn away from our sins and we'll continue in that thread today um, so let's turn to, um, let me share. Right, so let's turn to Romans 2 and 5. And we're actually going to look at that in the complete Jewish Bible. So we are looking at Romans chapter 2 verse 5 in the complete Bible. Jewish Bible. But by your stubbornness, by your unrepentant heart, you are storing up anger for yourself on the day of anger when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So what we want to see in the scripture is the, the heart posture, the stubbornness in the unrepentance. 
it is tied together. It's that 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 pride, that 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 mindset of I won't be moved, I won't um, change my mind when presented with compelling information, compelling arguments. That's really what stubbornness is. Is you are presented with a compelling argument, and you in your mind say, "Nope, I don't believe you. I don't accept it." Or I'm not going. To, I'm not going to do that. All of that is centered in a spirit, a spirit of pride, where you think higher of yourself and your self importance when compared to Jesus. That I am unwilling to submit. I am unwilling to bow down. I am unwilling to bend the knee. So when we're talking about as a, as a step of conversion, that first critical step of repentance, a person who's prideful. And stubborn and arrogant and haughty, they will not repent. Point blank, period. Because it requires you willingly. So even if you're suffering, as we saw in scripture, due, due to your stubbornness, due to your pride, due to operating in sin, you are suffering. You are being persecuted. You are being judged as a result of your sin. You still, in that moment, have to make the decision to repent. And we saw that when we looked at the scriptures about the children of Israel as a nation. That oftentimes, when they when they strayed away from God in their stubbornness and their pride, they were humbled by being afflicted, by being oppressed, by being attacked. But they still had to make the decision to repent, to ask for forgiveness, to turn away from that sin. And walk uprightly before God. So let's continue. And we're going to look at a few more scriptures. And then we're going to see even more steps within the repentance process. That still requires us to humble ourselves. We have to willingly submit to repentance. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 55. And we're going to read verses 6 and 7. And we're going to look at that in the New Living Translation. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Sorry, that is Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6 and 7 in the New Living Translation. So starting at verse 6. six seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God, for he will forgive generously. So what this passage of scripture, what we see is is the decision, the process of making, of opting in to repentance. Making the decision while it is available to you. But you have to change your ways. You have to make the decision to banish the very thought of doing wrong. You have to make the decision to turn to the Lord. To ask forgiveness. And I think one of the things that the, the church as an entity, as a whole, has done a poor job. Is of teaching that repentance is not just a feeling you have. It is not just a emotional response. It is a decision that you are making. And that decision is rooted in humility because you are willingly doing these steps that Isaiah is talking about. You are willingly saying, Lord, I was wrong. I was operating contrary to your word. I was operating contrary to your commandments. I was operating contrary to your character, to what you desire. I was living a lifestyle of sin. You have to admit you were wrong. That's how you make a decision to then turn away. If I never acknowledge, if I never humble myself and admit what I was doing was wrong, it was sin. I will turn back to it. 
And I just remember when Tremiko taught about repentance, right? That was one of the things we were talking about with people still struggling with the sin after going through the born again process is because they never truly repented. They never made that decision to say, I am done with that lifestyle. And part of that is the humility, humility to admit that that lifestyle is sinful and that it is wrong to live in. It is wrong to operate in. It is wrong to participate in. But stubbornness and pride will keep us operating in those things because we, we, we never made the decision to humble ourselves, to willingly submit our knee, willingly to bow down, willingly to put ourselves to submission to God's way. That's the conversation we need to be having about repentance. So when we're building disciples and we're talking about how integrated humility is, we, as more senior disciples, when we're discipling others, that's what we need to be discerning. Do you have a spirit of pride or are you operating in the spirit of humility? Because if you're operating in the spirit of pride, repentance is going to be an issue for you. All right, let's look at another scripture. So let's go to, we're going to stay in the New Living Translation. And we're going to read James chapter 4, verse 8. So we're staying in the New Living Translation, reading James chapter 4, verse 8. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinner. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. The decision. What are you going to decide to place your loyalty in? So what we're really seeing with these, with these scriptures is there is a crossroad. We're not across a fork in the road. You have to make a decision. You can't walk both ways. So when it comes to repentance, that's why humility is so important. It's because in saying no to sin and saying no to the world, you are saying yes to God. But saying no to God means you're saying yes to the world. There's no maybe in between, right? There's no, there's no line that you can walk. There's no fence that you can sit on. You are either with God or against God. That's the way we have to look at the decision. And so when I'm presented with the option, will you choose to turn away? Will you choose to walk away? Humility my willingness to say yes. That's where it comes from. That's the humility. That's operating in humility. My willingness to say yes. Not my will, but thine will be done. Submit the knee. To subjugate myself under God's authority. To live in unison and in righteousness and holiness with God. You must repent. You can't have one without the other. And that is what really boggles the mind is society. That is what they're preaching and teaching is that you can have both. Right. You just cover with grace. You cover with mercy and you're all good. You, you don't have to fully commit. What? Because you're only human, right? We all make mistakes. All For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But when we look at scripture, that is not what is taught about repentance. It is, it is taught as two one-way roads going in different directions. Are you going to go the way of God and repent and make the decisions to say, yes, Lord, I will submit the knee. I will bow down. Or are you going to say no because of my stubbornness and my pride? Because I don't want to live the way you want me to, God. I don't want to acknowledge that what I've been doing, what I believe to be right, what I've been told is right, the lifestyle that I've come accustomed to is wrong.
And that's really where that pride and stubbornness comes into place is admitting I am wrong. My hobbies, they are contrary to the word of God. Therefore, they are sin. The words that I use are contrary to the word of God. Therefore, they are sin. The lifestyle that I participate is contrary to the word of God. Therefore, it is sin. That's the decision that's on the table with repentance. Are you ready to admit that your life is contrary to the word of God and you are living in sin and it is wrong? And you are submitting yourself to the authority of God, which then means the lifestyle that I need to lead has to line up with what he says. My character has to line up to what he says. My thought processes, my worldview, my habits, my hobbies, the things that I participate in have to be in right standing with God. Am I willing to make that decision? All right, let's look at one more passage of scripture. Uh, and I'll open it up for questions and discussion. Um, so let's go to Matthew chapter 21, verse 28 through 32. And we're going to look at that in the New King James Version. So Matthew chapter 21, verse 28 through 32. And we're looking at that, looking at that in the New King James Version. But what do you think? A man had two sons and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted and went. Then he came to the second and said, likewise, Telling the, the second son to go work in the vineyard. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. Talking to the scribes, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. So what Jesus is highlighting within this parable and showing that the first son who did the will of his father first told him no, made the decision. Man, I ain't trying to do all that. But afterward, he regretted. He had conviction. He had godly sorrow and made the decision. You know what? That's not right. He then went. Verse the second son who lied to his face, but his heart never changed. He didn't go and do it. He didn't make the decision to do right. He told him he would. He gave him lip service, but he didn't make the decision and take the necessary action to do right. So now when Jesus is talking to these people who know the word, who, who, who have studied and taught the Old Testament, who are in charge of enforcing the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. Overseeing the Hebrews. You, you already know. But. In adding to that. You had a sign. And you saw other people. Which the sign was John the Baptist. Who came. To teach repentance. You didn't believe. Everything you knew. Everything you learned. Everything that you have been taught. Everything you supposedly have studied. You then see John the Baptist coming and saying, repent, and you didn't believe. But then you saw the tax collectors and the harlots who live a lifestyle contrary to the word of God, believe John and converted, made the decision. What I am doing is wrong. And you still seeing that 
seeing folks that you have said are sin, they're sinners and we should not associate with them, making the decision to turn away from the lifestyles you condemn, you still did not believe. You did not make the decision to humble yourself in turn. So that is why humility is so tied to the decision of repentance because it requires you to admit you were wrong and then willingly turn away from it. So question for um, when now looking at it, time repentance to humility, when you made the decision And this is for those who are willing to share. When you made the decision to truly repent and turn away, did you see that as operating in humility? No, I didn't. When I I did it. Nope, I didn't. Why not? I just thought like, oh... I don't want to listen to the Lord. Like, I didn't think of it as, like, humbling myself or, like, humbling in any way or being, you know, yeah. I mean, pretty much just that. I just didn't think of it as that. Like, that's not what comes to my mind when I was thinking about repenting uh, for any sins I was doing. Yeah. I mean, it's what a natural think of it. (laughs) And so after going through these scriptures, how do you look at it now? Like, just what's your perspective and POV on it? Like, thinking back to it. Wait, repeat the question. So, after going through these scriptures, right, and what we've been talking about, like, now reflecting back, does it connect the dots for you that, oh, I was operating in humility. Like, I did make the decision that, you know, God, what I am doing is wrong, and I don't want to do that anymore. I want to follow you. Yeah, I think so. It does click, like now, because like I know some of like some of uh, when I especially when I first came to the Lord and was repenting from them sins, a lot of it was just like I don't want to go to hell and I want to listen to the Lord. But it, like a lot of it was I don't want to go to hell. And then like as time progressed and it was like still sins I was struggling with, it then became like I want to respect you, Lord, especially when we're going through. Um, I think some of the previous lessons, I don't know, at this point, it could have been part of this lesson, just another subsection. I don't even know. But, like, you know, like, not obeying him is not respecting him or okay. showing him reverence. reverence. Yeah. yeah, showing him reverence. And it was like, it became that over time of, oh, I'm not, I'm not respecting, I'm not showing you reverence. I'm not respecting your words. Like, I'm not, of course, like, being obedient and stuff. And then it became, I want to do that for you because I want you to be the, the, the head of my life and who I'm obeying more than anything. Um, and now it's like, yeah, I want to listen to his word. So, yes. Yeah, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> no, great. Anyone else want to share? Uh, I do want to say uh, it's, it, it, it is a, a huge difference from when you started to once you continue your path. Um, now is my understanding, like to me, it, we live in this lifestyle to be like Jesus just because when, I know when we pass on, we will still have our, our same, like, if I'm saying this right, mindset. Our same mindset as in, like, he won't be controlling us to do good in the new world, if that makes sense. Because we, we're trying to create this behavior, not create, like, have the same um, lifestyle as Jesus in the new world. Like, that makes sense. <laughs> Well, so we'll, we won't have, so, um, and Tremiko, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm not understanding the question, but in the second earth, we won't, if, for us that are alive now and transition in the sense of either dying and going to heaven and then coming back with Jesus or being raptured up, we won't be in our mortal bodies. So we won't be subjected to the types of temptation and issues that we deal with now as human beings. Right. So, yeah. So when we go to be with him and wait and have we will not have our mortal bodies. And then when he gives us bodies again, it will be the, um, the glorified body. So it won't be a body of sin. So we won't have those struggles. Correct. 
Yeah. Say it again. So I think what you're trying to say is, correct me if I'm wrong, Mm -hmm. that the goal while we're in this earth now is to adopt the mindset of Christ so that we can go to be with him because that's the mindset you need to be with him for all eternity. So it's not like you're going to learn the mindset when you get, you got to have it now to make it to eternity with him. So that's what you're trying to say. Okay. Got it. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And we're going to look at that when we start talking about taking accountability and then exhibiting changes in fruit that uh, show repentance. And as I said, it is a decision that you make and it is a decision that you continue to make. And it requires you to operate in humility because you are willingly submitting yourself. So even if you look at it from a perspective, which is which is all correct, right? Like I am submitting myself to your authority. I am respecting and reverencing you over myself. All of that is putting is putting yourself to operate in the spirit of modesty and humility because you're exalting Jesus. You're exalting his word, his characteristics above yourself, which is your flesh. And yes, you have to continue to do that. And I, and I think what we what we've seen in um in really what Radeja and what she shared, right, is as she continued to mature in that continued process of repentance, there then came the shift in mindset. But even in the initial decision of, I don't want to go to hell. I want to spend time with you, Jesus. You still have to make the decision to submit yourself because there are a lot of folks and we'll, we'll see that in other aspects of scripture. And you, I mean, you've, we've met people like that just in, in, in meeting folks out while discipling. You know, they, some people say like, hell's not real. Or I, I know people who legit are just like, yeah, I know I'm not making it into heaven and I'm fine with that. They have made a decision in their pride and their stubbornness that I would rather live my life the way I want and suffer the consequences later. If those consequences actually even exist. So great point. Anyone else? All right, so let's continue to look at, so with that decision, right, operating in humility, one of the things when it comes to repentance is you have to take accountability. You have to say that what I did, what I operated in was my fault. I was doing it. Accountability is a part of repentance. You can't put that on to someone else. Someone else is not responsible for your sins. You have to be accountable for your own actions. So let's look at that in scripture. So let's go to Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. And that is Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. And we're going to look at that in the New King James Version. He who covers his sin will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. This is all operating through humility. And I want to make sure we're, make, we're connecting these. That is the willingness to confess and forsake them. You have to make that decision. When... It's so funny, like when we talk about people like apologizing, right? Like when someone apologizes to you, uh, a true apology takes in accountability. I'm sorry for the things that I did to you. Even if it was unintentional, right? I apologize for the misunderstanding that I caused. Versus, I'm sorry that you were offended. That is not an apology. So even if my intention was not to offend you, my intention was not to disrespect you, I still have to own and take accountability for the fact that it happened. I'm sorry for for causing a misunderstanding. Here's what I really meant. It's the same thing when we repent. We have to take accountability. We can't tell God, God, I'm sorry that you were offended. I'm sorry that your laws don't 
accommodate my lifestyle. Sounds like a you problem, right? And so when we see people and when we have conversations and whether it's if we're just being honest, if we have to apologize to someone or someone has apologized, does that that pride of admitting what I did was wrong, what I did hurt you, what I did offended you, what I did disrespected you, what I did cause you not to trust me. It requires humility to take that step to own it. I did it and it was wrong. So in repentance, we have to take accountability. If we don't take accountability, we're putting it off to something else, right? Well, Satan made me do it. Well, if I wasn't in this position, I wouldn't have done that. Well, if it, if this wasn't going on in my life, I wouldn't have made that choice. You still did. No one can make you do something. And that's what humility as a disciple is that willingness to submit. God cannot make you. You have to make the decision to do it. It doesn't matter of the outside variables. So even if you are being afflicted because you're operating in sin and you're reaping the fruit of the seed you sowed, you still have to make the decision to be like, God, I'm sorry. I was wrong and I'm turning away from it. And that is a common thread with the children of Israel. They had to take accountability. Let's look at that. Let's continue to look at that in scripture. So now let's go to Psalm and we're going to look at 38 verse 18. And we're going to look at this in the ESV. So we're at Psalm 38 verse 18. And we're looking at that in the English Standard Version, ESV. I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin. The accountability. The admission of wrongdoing, of disrespecting, of not reverencing, not living up to the standard of God requires humility. And so when we talk about the conversion process... And how critical as an anchor point it is for a disciple, right? Unless you are fully converted, you cannot be an effective disciple because there is not a diplomatic way to teach and preach the gospel and convert souls to Christ. I can't, well, I can see how you would look at it that way. No, because Jesus has a prescribed way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. You have to go through him. So there is a prescribed way in which he says, this is how you receive the gift of eternal life. So part of that conversion process, a disciple has to be converted to that mindset, fully converted. And repentance is the stepping stone into that, of repenting from a lifestyle of sin, And then living a repented lifestyle. You have to own what you did. When confessing, when asking for forgiveness, own what you did. Take accountability. That requires a spirit of humility. Of willingly to subjugate yourself to say what I did was wrong. There's so many now, there's so many sins that people are trying to make. Okay, in the eyes of God. Whether we're talking about uh, divorce, whether we're talking about fornication, whether we're talking about homosexuality, whether we're talking about lying and stealing, whether we're talking about not tithing. Everyone keeps saying, oh, it's not it's not a sin or that's taken out of context or God doesn't have issue with that if you do it this way. Perfect example. I I was listening to a debate where this man is, he is gay and he is married and he calls himself a Christian and he is a pastor. And what he teaches is that homosexuality in the same way as heterosexuality. So God's way of man and woman 
falls under the same standard of man and man or woman and woman as long as it is covered under the covenant of marriage. That homosexuality is only a sin in the same way in other forms of fornication, if not done within the protection in the covenant of marriage. That is stubbornness. That is pride. Because instead of just simply saying my lifestyle is contrary to the word of God, owning the fact that my habits, my lifestyle choices, my decisions is sin and I need to repent of it. No, I'm going to manipulate God's word to fit it in. How prideful and stubborn do you need to be to say that to, to put yourself in the position to say, no, God, what you said is wrong. This is what it needs to be to accommodate to a modern society. That's why humility is so important to repentance. And we have to look at it from that sense of taking accountability is making a decision to I was wrong. I own that what I did was wrong. I own that what I did was contrary to the word of God. If you can't do that. You can't move forward into repentance because you're going to come back to it again. All right, let's look at one more scripture. So let's go to Psalm 51 and we're going to read that verse one through four and we're going to stay in the English Standard Version. So we're looking at Psalm 51, one verse four, verses one through four and the English Standard Version. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. That is a call for forgiveness and repentance. So here we see that this this is a prayer asking for forgiveness. And in every aspect of this prayer, it is about what I did. My transgressions, my iniquity, my sin. I did this to you, God. I sinned against you, Lord. I have done what is evil in your sight. To admit and take accountability requires your willingness, your humility. Because you have to own it. You have to admit to it. You have to confess it. When you distance it from yourself, when you try to put it on something else, whether that's the environment, whether that's culture, whether that's how you grew up, whether that it was because other people, I was just following the crap. You're not owning it. You're not willingly submitting yourself. And you're going to struggle with repenting because it it requires the self It requires the meekness, the putting down your self-importance, to dealing with the shame, dealing with the embarrassment, and just owning what I did was wrong. And so when we're talking about developing disciples and looking specifically at humility, it starts with the day one process of repenting. You're still struggling with these types of sins. You're still struggling with that one stronghold that's been on you for your entire life. Have you truly repented? Have you owned and taken accountability for the sin that you did? And are you now of the mindset of willingly submitting it to God? Thoughts, questions, comments um, before we go to uh, actions. Okay, so still talking about repentance, right? And humility being tied into it. So now that 
I have to acknowledge and own and admit what I was doing was wrong. Take accountability of my part in it. It's still it's still up to me. I'm to what Andrew was talking about that continued process. I now have to exhibit changes in my relationships, in my habits, in my hobbies, so that it truly shows repentance. The fruit shows repentance. My actions show repentance. It's not enough for it to just be words. So let's look at that in scripture. So let's go to Matthew chapter three, verse eight. And we're gonna look at that in the New Living Translation. So Matthew chapter three, verse eight in the New Living Translation. Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. So if in having a conversation with someone and you're telling them, hey, what you're doing is wrong, right? And we're not even talking about saying, hey, you know, in order to fix this specific thing in this job, you need to do it A, B, C, and D. That's the way you have to do it. And you said, you know what? No, I know better than you. I can skip them steps. I'm going to just do it this way. And it doesn't work out. And it continues not to work out. Humility will have you say, you know what? You were right. I should have done it the way you told me to. And I did it. So now I'm going to do it the way you told me to. And continue to do that so I can see the changes. Versus the, I'm going to get set in my ways. My pride is going to make me stubborn. That I'm going to continue to operate in this way that I know is wrong. That I know is not producing the, producing the results it needs to be. But I don't want to admit I was wrong. And so that's what we see when it comes to the actions of repentance. Because it's not enough just to say, I was wrong. Are you, have you humbled yourself to the point? Have you humbled yourself to where you admit you were wrong, you take accountability, and then now my actions, like we saw in the parable that Jesus with the two sons, the one son, go work in the vineyard. No, I shouldn't have said that. Let me go do it. Versus the second son who gave him lip service. I'll go, sir. And never went to work in the vineyard. Are we operating to where we can see the repentance that we give with our mouth, the forgiveness that we request with our mouth, the confession that we do with our mouth? Are we committing the actions that follow up with it? Because that is all tied to the humility. Lord, you said don't go left. I'm not going to go left. I'm going to go right. I'm going to humble myself and do what you told me to do. Stop doing what you said I shouldn't be doing. Spending more time in doing the things that you say that I should do. And that's what we see in scripture. So let's go to Luke chapter 3 verse 8. And we're going to read this in the New King James Version. And it's just a follow up on the previous one. Um, so this is Luke chapter 3 verse 8 in the New King James Version. Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. That spirit of pride, that self-importance, that arrogance. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. doesn't matter who your daddy is. See, that, that's the mindset of someone who is prideful and, stare, and, and, and stubborn. That, that's, that self-righteousness, that self-importance. I don't have to do what other people do. And that was the mindset of the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. That they kept bringing up, we are the heirs of Abraham. From God's perspective, that ain't got nothing to do with what I'm telling you to do. If anything, it's an indictment. Because you should know better. Because if you truly were the sons of Abraham, you would live like Abraham lived. That's the difference in the action, the mindset of someone who is prideful. They're not going to repent. They may say it with their mouths. But it won't reflect in their actions because it requires fully submitting. It requires fully subjecting yourself. 
operating in submission, bowing down, bending the knee. That's why it's such a struggle. Because <laughs> you got to tell yourself no and tell God yes. So let's, let's look at some more uh, scripture about the, this action, the actions that we need to be taking. Um, so let's go to Psalm 34 and we're going to look at verse 14. And we're going to look at this in the New Living Translation. So Psalm 34 verse 14 in the New Living Translation. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. You got to make that decision. It's not, that says it's not enough, right? You have to turn away from the evil and do good. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter uh, your genealogy. Doesn't matter that your, your parents and your grandparents had a great relationship with Jesus. What are you doing? Are you operating in the spirit of humility and true repentance, taking the necessary actions? Jesus said to stop hanging out with those people because they cause you to sin. They cause you to gossip. They cause you to lie. Have you stopped hanging out with them? Or are you making excuses? That's pride. That's stubbornness. Jesus said to stop watching this content. Stop feeding your eye gates and your ear gates with this, this junk that caused you to operate and sinful things operate in things that are not in align with your relationship with me. Have you stopped it? No. If no, then you are putting yourself above God. Your self-importance, your pride, your arrogance, your stubbornness. Operating in that disobedience. That's, that's why when we see repentance, it's humility. Because you have to put God above yourself. That is how you operate in humility. I am putting someone else's importance above my own. Let's look at another. Any thoughts, questions, or comments while we uh, shift to this next verse? Verse 15. This is Ezekiel. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go to Ezekiel. Just had to make sure it wasn't Ezra. <laughs> so we're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 21 through 23. And we're going to look at that in the New King James Version. And then we're just going to continue to keep seeing that when it comes to repentance, it takes action. It's a decision you make that is carried out through your actions and changes in your lifestyle. So we're looking at Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 21 through 23. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins, which he has committed, keeps all my statues and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, surely live. He shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him because of the righteousness which he has done. He shall live. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? The wicked man, the sinner, the evil man has to take action, has to turn away, has to confess, has to take accountability. And then live a lifestyle that is pleasing to the eyes of God. Does, does no longer operate and participate and do what is wicked. But keeps the statutes of God. Does what is lawful and right. That spirit of humility. That, that's where you're operating in. Because you're continuing to say to God. Not my will Lord. But thine will be done. I'm not participating in those things anymore. I'm not doing that. I'm not hanging out with those people. I'm changing my habits. I'm changing my hobbies. Because you are more important. Going back to what Ray Deja was talking, that reverence, that respect. You are more important than the pleasures of my flesh. The attachments and benefits that I got from sin. 
This is the conversation we're talking about with repentance. When a person is struggling with repentance, it is they are operating in a spirit of pride. Because they are saying, Lord, my, my needs, my flesh, my carnal needs, my carnal desires, they are more important than you. You aren't important enough for me to make the decision to sub- submit myself, to submit my flesh to you. All right, let's look at a few more. So let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Verse 29 through 30. And we're going to stay in the New King James for that. Um, so we'll look at this one and then we have uh, three more. Um, so we'll look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 and 30 in the New King James Version. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. This is what Jesus is teaching. Operating in repentance requires an action of you. It requires for you to take steps to change your behaviors, the things that you participate in, the people that you hang around with. If it is causing you to sin, it has to go. Will you make that decision? Will you humble yourself and subject yourself to Jesus' authority? So I can, I can tell you what to do, but I can't make you do it. That's how you operate in repentance. I, I have to do it. Jesus has told me, hey, if there is literally, this is the commandment. If, if there is something that is causing you to sin, it is better to sacrifice whatever that thing is and live than for it to cause you to be tossed into hell. But then when we talk to people, when we counsel people on whatever they're struggling with, Whatever stronghold has over their life that is causing them not to operate in repentance. Is that's the mindset. That I just I can't I can't kick it. I can't stop it. It's not that big of a deal. I don't understand why I have to stop doing this or stop hanging out with that person. Because it's causing you to sin. When did that stop being enough? Yes, but there are so many conversations that I'm sure. Trey and Tremiko can attest to as teachers as well is when I, I teach or when I counsel and say hey that is caught that right there all the stuff you're talking about in terms of you struggling and you operating in sin and you making bad decisions that's the root of that yes but yes but I grew up with them Yes, but I don't understand why I can't do that. Yes, but that doesn't seem realistic. You operating in pride. That's what it comes down to. Because you're saying whatever that yes, but is, that is more important than Jesus. Because what should be enough is that it is causing you to sin. That's the only why you should need. Thoughts, questions there before we go to uh, the next verse. All right, let's go to Matthew 18. We're going to look at 8 through 9. And we'll read that in the New King James Version. This is Matthew chapter 18, verses 8 and 9 in the New King James Version. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame, so talking about internal life, or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast, to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye 
rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. As we can, this is clear, like we've seen so many scriptures that is talking about the actions that we need to take for repentance. Jesus did not take this lightly. That we have to humble ourselves and operate in the changes necessary to live, to show that we are living a repentant lifestyle, that we have turned away. We got to take the steps. It's not up to anyone else. We can't be made to do it. That's why it's humility. That's why it's operating in humility, because we are willingly bowing down. We can't be forced to do it. You can be dragged to water, but at the end of the day, you cannot be made to drink. Let's look at two more. Let's go to Acts chapter 26, verse 20. And we're going to look at that in the New Living Translation. So that's Acts chapter 26, verse 20 in the New Living Translation. I preach first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all Judea. And also to the Gentiles, that all must repent of their sins and turn to God and prove they have changed by the good things they do. Words are not enough. You have to prove through your actions that you have changed. And take the necessary steps to make sure that you're marching towards that. That means I got to put me down and put God up. I got to humble myself and exalt Jesus. What I want to do is irrelevant. The benefits I got from it is irrelevant. The fact that it's pleasing to my flesh is irrelevant. Is it pleasing to God? All right, one more. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27. And we'll look at that in the New King James Version. So this is Ephesians chapter 24. Sorry, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27 in the New King James Version. So that's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27 in the New King James Version. Nor give place to the devil. So, actually, let me just read that in context. <laughs> Let's go to 25. And, um, what do I want? Let's go to 25 and 28. Okay. So, we'll start at 25 and read to 28. So, still in Ephesians chapter 4. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do, let, do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. So what we see here is all of the action that is taking place of someone who is repentant, that should be operating in a lifestyle pleasing to Jesus. And what... I want to highlight with verse 27 is they do not make room for Satan. They do not make opportunity for Satan to tempt them, to put them in positions to sin. That's what that verse 27 means. Nor give place to the devil. Do not give opportunity. And there are so many people. That, that's exactly what they do. They tempt themselves by the, the situations, the interactions, and the places that they put themselves in. You're playing with fire. But an action of someone who is living, who has made the decision to repent and showing actions that prove that they are repentant does not do that. Thoughts? Comments, questions before we move on to the next section. So what we just covered is 
time humility as we see throughout throughout the process of repentance. So the initial decision, the owning and taking accountability of our sin, and then taking the necessary actions to prove that we are truly living a repentant lifestyle. Questions or comments? No, this is not close enough. Okay. All right. So now what we're going to look at is the next step within the conversion, right? We talk about, and we're not going to spend a ton of time here, um, but we're going to we're going to see the steps of take of making the decision to be baptized in water, so fully submerged, baptized in Jesus' name, and receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the sign of speaking out of tongues requires humility. Because we have to submit to Jesus' prescribed way for salvation once informed of the gospel. So once a person has preached the gospel, they have a decision to make. And so we're going to focus on one, two, three, four, five. We're going to look at five examples where we see that they are positioned with the decision. They have a decision to make. They have been preached the gospel. And they can, in their pride and arrogance, say, no, I'm not turning. I'm not turning. And I'm not going through this. I'm not going through the baptism process. I don't need it. It's not required for salvation. Whatever argument you want to use. Or they willingly submit themselves to it. Um, So let's start with Hebrews. Chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 7 through 15. In the New King James Version. And we're going to start here so we can see the heart position. Is it one of humility or is it one of pride and stubbornness and stiff neckedness? <laughs> so Hebrews chapter 3 verses 7 through 15. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. Where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. In departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. As in the rebellion. So specifically this is addressed. To believers who happen to be Hebrew. That's why it's referencing to their forefathers. And so when we're talking about disciples. And humility as a necessity. It's from the same mindset. And we can tie it. That principle we can tie. To baptism and and the receipt of the Holy Spirit. Is do not harden your heart. So for. A person who is going through the conversion process, when you feel the conviction, when you hear the voice of the Lord, because we know that God speaks to those who are sinners to draw them to repentance and draw them into baptism. Harden not your heart. The same principle applies. Do not make the decision to resist out of pride, arrogance and stubbornness and harden your heart against God. Every one of us, when we were sinners, had to make that decision. Whether if it was a course over years or one experience when we were just in the right place, right time at church. There was a conviction that happened. There was an opportunity presented. And we made the decision, Lord, what must I do to be saved? And we're going to see in these examples of multiple people making that same decision out of humility, subjecting my will, subjecting the worldview, subjecting what culture has taught me 
and saying, Lord, I submit to you and your authority. So let's start it off so we can we can see one example um, just in general, and then we'll get into specific examples. So let's go to Acts chapter 7, verse 51, which is going to set us up to go then look at these other examples. Um, and we're looking at in the New King James Version. So Acts chapter 7, verse 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You, talking to the, this is specifically being addressed, uh, I believe, to uh, some, some Jews. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. So this is going to set up when we start looking at these examples of these people being placed in positions to make a decision. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. So that pride, that stubbornness causes you to resist. Humility is you submit yourself willingly. So you're no longer resisting. We have to make that decision. We have to humble ourselves when presented with the opportunity to be baptized in Jesus' name, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, with the sign of speaking in tongues. After being preached the gospel, after being said, Jesus desires that you repent. That you be, you be water baptized, full submersion in Jesus' name, and be filled with the Holy Spirit, the sign of speaking in other tongues. What are you going to do? Are you going to resist or are you going to submit? Pride is where resistance comes out. Submission comes through humility. All right, so now let's look at some examples. And the first one we're going to start with is Nicodemus. So let's go to John chapter 3, verse 1 through 21. So once again, we're starting with Nicodemus and we're going to read John chapter 3, verse 121. And we're starting here as it will build into the other examples, because it's here that we see Jesus outline the full process. As Nicodemus asks him questions of what must I do to be saved? How do I spend eternal life with you? What are you talking about? And we see Jesus build out. This is exactly what I am telling you is necessary. So that's why we're starting here. So John chapter 3, verse 1 through 21. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 4, Nicodemus says, said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So here, just so we have context as we go along, Nicodemus as a Pharisee, the Pharisees are against Jesus. That's why he went to go see Jesus by cover of night. He's afraid. I don't want to be seen with you because the people that I'm with don't like you. But he's telling him, I believe what you say about yourself because there is no way you could do the things that you do unless you were who you say you are. And Jesus is telling him, that's great. But here's the process. It's great that you believe me. It's great that you believe in who I am. Here's the process to enter the kingdom of God. He tells him he has to be born again. And Nicodemus, what do you mean by that? That's why we're starting here. Because this is where Jesus outlines, great question. I'm going to explain it to you what I mean by being born again. He gives us the prescribed way. He gives us what we are making a decision on. We can't alternate. We can't change it. We can't say, well, this is not what it... No, he's telling us specifically what the prescribed way is. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. 
The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel? And do you not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. So Jesus literally walks Nicodemus through the fulfillment of the Old Testament. That's why he asked him, are you not a teacher of Israel? So what walks him through that Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophets and then walks him through the gospel. That here's the why. But how you access this is you have to be born of water and born of spirit in the name of Jesus. So Nicodemus gets the gets the full picture. And so we can look at that at this conversation and say and point to. This is the prescribed way. This is what Jesus said was necessary. That we have to be born of water, full submersion, baptized of water in Jesus' name, and filled with the Holy Spirit with the sign of speaking in other tongues in order to have access to the kingdom of God. There's no other way around it. So now we have a decision to make. Will we resist, as what we saw in Acts 7.51, Will we resist or will we submit? And so we're going to look at the first, we'll look at the uh, first example of this decision being made and then we'll wrap up for today. So let's go to Acts. We're going to stay in Acts. So we're going to look at a couple of different verses. So we're going to go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 5 through 28. And then 36 through 46 in the New King James Version. So Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 28, and then 36 through 46. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, talking about the sound of Pentecost, the multitude came together. And were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. So those who Jesus told to go to Jerusalem and wait, who were then in the uh, Acts 2, 1 through 4, filled with the Holy Spirit, with the sign of speaking in other tongues. The crowd, this multitude, is hearing their languages. Verse 7. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak? Galileans and how is it that we hear each our own language in which we were born Parthians and Medes and Elamites those dwelling in Mesopotamia 
Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Serene, visitors from Rome, both Jews, so actually ethnic Hebrews, and proselytes, those who have converted to the religion of Judaism. That's a ton of people. And continue, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? 13, others mocking said they are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God do through him, did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I might not that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your holy one to see corruption. You have made known to me the way of life, the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. So before we go to the next 10 verses, we see that this crowd sees the disciples and the others filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking with the sign in other tongues, languages that they then understood, that they knew as a Galilean, there is no way that you should know Arabic. There is no way that you should know Libyan or whatever the other languages they were speaking. There's no way you should know that. But you do, and I hear it, and I hear you proclaiming the magni- and magnifying God. So then Peter stands up and he preached. And it, it continues to go on, but he preaches the gospel. He preaches who Jesus is, the manifestation of God the Father in the flesh, the fulfillment of the prophets, specifically referencing Joel, and that you as Jews crucified him, but he has been risen to new life. And he continues to go on as we go in verse 36 to 30, 36 to 46. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, talking about the crowd, they were cut to the heart. Remember what we talked about in Hebrews 3, 7 through 15, not hardening your heart. They are not yet filled with the Holy Spirit, but they are convicted. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? I have a decision to make. And I'm asking you, I am convicted. I have been cut to the heart. I want to know more about this Jesus you speak of. What is it that I need to do? 
Verse 38, then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to who all and to all who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call. Here's what you need to do. I'm telling you, you asked, what must I do to be saved? What shall we do? Repent, be baptized, be filled with the Holy Spirit. What did they do? Verse 40, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them. So Peter is still preaching the gospel, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. Pause here. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. They made the decision. They submitted themselves to what they were told. There were some that did not make that decision. That's why we are given this context to then to those who gladly received, who accepted, who acknowledged, who made the decision to set their pride aside and humble themselves. They made the decision. And were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine. And fellowship. In the breaking of bread. And in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together. And had all things in common. And sold their possessions and goods. And divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. So when presented with the opportunity to repent, to be baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, they made a decision to submit themselves to Jesus's prescribed way and his authority rather than resisting it through pride and stubbornness. Thoughts, questions, comments. Okay, so next week we'll pick up from here and we'll look at three more examples so we can continue to see how humility is a necessity for the process of baptism in both water and spirit. Lord, we just thank you for this lesson. Um, We appreciate, oh God, the word that has come forth and that it will fall on good ground to those who have heard it. We uh, thank you for the discussion, um, discussions that we had. Lord, we just pray right now that everyone on the sound of my voice will go on to enjoy their day. We come against any retribution, persecution, tribulation, or affliction that will come for this word's sake right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Also, thank you.